Sink clap. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's how the left Hey there guys, welcome to Red Ride. Final Glide Oz here, and today I want to do a recreation of a video that I did about two years ago. I did a build video on the Impulse RC Alien, and I think today it's got like something like 300,000 views. A lot of you have said that you learnt a lot from that video and it was very, very beneficial to you. Whether you are building an alien or not, you said that uh, it worked really well for you. So what I wanted to do was do another video with updated electronics and build uh, the frame that I currently fly, which is the reverb and all the components that I use. And hopefully you guys out there will get the same sort of benefit that you got last time. And some of the new guys where you probably haven't seen that video, maybe you might get a benefit from it. So let's get stuck into this and we'll get started and I'll show you the components that I'm gonna be using. What I'm gonna be starting off with, of course, is the Impulse RC reverb frame with five inch arms. Of course I helped to do design this uh, frame. The frame itself really is just, it's, a, it's an evolution from the alien frame which I've used for a very long time and been very happy with. So Impulse RC frame, the main base package, five inch arms and you also get the the hardware package. So the hardware package we've got today is just the steel hardware. Of course there is also the availability for a bit of extra cost for the alloy hardware. If you want to go for the alloy version you'll save about 10 grams but really depends on what's important to you. Uh, also we have the PDB package. This is the base PDB. The build that I'm actually going to be using uh, is the new Impulse RC Reverb OSD PDB. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to show you how to build with both of these PDBs. Uh, when it comes to the receiver, myself, I'm old school. I've got the old school X4R receiver and this is one of the old ones you can't actually buy anymore. This one has UFL connectors on it and quarter wave antennas. I bought about 15 of these years ago and I still use them. They're the only ones that I trust but you can't really buy them anymore. But, I mean, use whatever receiver works for you. What I've done is I've decased it, I've depinned it, and I've hardwired these wires on here. So that way it's just a little bit more compact and a bit more weatherproof. For fly controller, I'm going to be using the KISS FC V2. This to me, I love this uh, fly controller. It's just so simple to set up, it works extremely well. Of course, combined with that, I'm going to be using the uh, KISS 32 amp ESCs. Combine that with it, ease of setup, they work really well, nice and smooth. As far as VTX is concerned, Immersion RC Tramp. I love using the Tramp purely because of the TNR uh, wand setup. I much prefer to change channels via a wand or the, the NFC system than I do through an OSD. It means that you can change channels, uh, bands, or whatever you want to do when the quad is unpowered, which when you're flying with other people is very, very handy to do. Pairing that with uh, Immersion RC Spiranet, I mean, use whatever antenna antenna you, you, uh, you like, but this antenna works well for me. It, this is the new stubby one, lighter weight, and it's also quite durable as well. So I still use the, the Session 5. Uh, I've still got plenty of those guys left for, for filming. So I've got a Brain 3D Session 5 mount. This is a special one that also allows you to put a uh, an ND filter in the front of it. So I use the TBS Jello Guard ND filter in the front there and then slide the uh, the Session 5 in there. But you can get these from um, most places, including Brain 3D. Works extremely well and nice, simple, solid setup for your for your GoPro option. As far as VTX cameras, you can use I, my preference is the uh, the Foxia Predator, but I also have a number of frames using the uh, the Runcam Eagle 2. So I don't have an, a, a Predator at the moment, so I'm going to use this Eagle 2. Both of those work quite well for me personally. I love CMOS. I don't use CCD anymore. It all comes down to personal preference, but if you haven't tried CMOS cameras yet, give them a go, they're really amazing. One thing I also like to do, which I don't have here handy with me, is I still actually like to get the camera and put a GoPro lens in it, like a one or two hero lens, like we did with the old Swifts and things like that. The field of view just seems to work best for me, and I like the, the color of the lens and so forth. So this is what I've got to use today. This will work just fine for what we're doing. Of course, props, I'm going to be using the HQ 5x4.5x3 props. Uh, these are actually a nice sort of middle ground between efficiency and thrust. I used to be on the 4.3s, I've recently gone to the 4.5s. They just tend to suit me a little bit better and the, the loss in flight time is very marginal. It's nice sort of balance there and it's still nice and efficient. Of course we're going to need two battery straps and finally we're going to be using the Rotor Riot Hype Train 2306 2450 kV motors. These guys, uh, I helped to design these guys and they just they suit perfectly for what I want to do. Uh, the nice lightweight, durable enough, and 
they work well for me. That's all the products that we're going to be used to building it. As far as extra bits that you're going to need, I've got a set of extra little odds and ends here and some basic tools which we'll go through now. So of course you're going to need some masking tape, some electrical tape, some double sided foam tape, some small zip ties, you'll need some heat shrink to go over the ESCs and a little bit of extra heat shrink to go over the SMA connector. 18 gauge wire and some 28 gauge wire. So I like to use 18 gauge wire for the ESCs and 28 gauge wire for things like your signal wire on your ESCs. It's big enough to do what it needs to do but it's not oversized. You'll need a, a Allen key set so you'll need a two and a half millimeter a two millimeter and a 1.5 millimeter drivers for your allen key sets basic things like needle nose pliers um, side cutters it's always good to have um, some wire strippers as well you don't need them but it, it does make the the job a little bit easier um, and little things like for example your soldering iron i can't go past my ts100 these things work absolutely brilliantly and of course your basic 60 40 type solder or 63 37 pick whichever one you want they both work really well and just some basic things this one you don't need but it's really handy to have and these are these little tweezers these make some of the more intricate soldering work really much more handy and easy to do so if you've got these i would highly recommend that uh, you use them so that's it about for all the tools and stuff so let's get stuck into actually building this sucker okay so we're going to start off assembling the lower part of the frame so what we're going to need is we're going to need the four arms your split bottom plate you're going to need some bolts from the hardware kit so you're going to need the cap head m3 by 10s the cap head m3 by 12s You'll need the uh, M3 press nuts, a uh, little M3 rubber standoffs, M3 washer, and a little M3 by 6 mil cap head bolt. Those two guys here are actually only used to help press in the press nuts, and after that you don't need them anymore. Uh, on top of that, you're going to need the PDB, so I've got both PDBs here, so this is your standard PDB, but I'm just going to show you the basics of how to install that. What we're going to be doing is actually installing the, uh, the full OSD PDB in there instead. So first up, what we want to do is we want to grab, this is the back or the, the back top of the, the split plate. So you can see this by, because these holes here are slightly enlarged and it's also a thinner 1.5 mil plate where on this one it's a 2 mil plate and the holes are smaller. So we'll start off with this guy, it doesn't matter which way you actually have it. And what we're going to do is we're going to press in the press nuts. You can actually just put this all together and then tighten it all up, but I'll show you the, the way that Impulse RC recommends that you do this. All you need to do is just place one of the press nuts on top and then you get your M3 by 6 nut. Place the washer over it, put that in place, and then you just tighten this up. And as you tighten it up, the press nut itself will go into position. As you tighten it, half the press nut slides into, side, into the side there and then you can see in here when this is nice and tight there's no gap underneath that that's nice and tight so once you've done that then it's just a matter of going ahead and tightening up all the other guys in a similar fashion people often ask how tight should I do up the bolts and so forth and these press nuts are a, another example of that this is how you do it grab one at one of your testicles and put it in your hand and start twisting it and Keep on twisting until it gets to a point where it is too uncomfortable to twist anymore. That's the tension that you want to have the bolt and you don't want to go any further. And I went and done this as a bit of a boo-boo here. These washers actually have two sides to them. When they're pressed cut, they actually have a sharp edge to them. If you have the, the sharp edge down, you can actually see that it cuts into the carbon fiber. It doesn't do anything for the strength of it, but it's a bit of a look there. So if you flip that around the other way, you won't actually get that cut into it. So if we have a look underneath now, you can see that first one that I did with the, the washer facing down, you can see that it's cut into there, where all these other ones where I've spun the washer around are nice and clean. So now this bolt and washer is a spare. You don't use this for the rest of the kit. The whole reason for that bolt and washer being in the kit is primarily to do that. So if you don't use that and you're wondering why these are spare, that's why you've got them. So now we have the, the top of the, the split bottom plate with the press nuts in there. And all we're going to do is we're going to join it up with the arms and the bottom plate. This is where we're going to be using the 4 by 3 mil by 10 mil cap head bolts and the 12 mil three mil bolts as well. There you've got two different lengths, so you've got to remember to use them in the right area. The shorter 10 mil bolts will go on the outside of the two bolt hole arms, and the, 10, the 12 mil will actually go on the inside. Now, one thing that Impulse RC also includes is these little cone washers as well, and these are intended to go over those bolt, uh, the bolts underneath on those cap head bolts 
Me personally, I don't actually use them on there. They don't really do anything for me. But if it's something that you want to put on there, go ahead and put them on there. On this build, I'm not going to worry about using them. So now we're going to get the bottom plate and we're going to grab a 12 mil and the 12 mil goes on the inside arm. And then we grab a 10 mil. 10 mil goes on the outside of the arm and then we just lay that in there. Now it's important to remember if you flip this around the wrong way it actually doesn't line up. There's only one way that the arm goes. You'll see that it'll line up sort of in the middle of the of this plate whereas if you've got it the wrong way around it'll be sort of off center and it won't look right. You'll know when you get it the right way around. Once we've got that then we bring this around here and this goes facing backwards like so and then we just tighten it up. Now I find it best to just to take up some of the slack, but don't bother tightening the arm just yet. Leave it loose so it's all rattling around. That way there's plenty of movement and freedom of movement to fit, to fit the other arms in. So then all we do is we just add the other arms in and make sure that the bolt holes line up with the wrong way around. 10 mil on the outside and 12 mil on the inside. Okay, so that's got all of those bolts in there nicely. And you can see on the outside, the bolt is nice and flush with the uh, press nut, where on the inside, the bolt goes out to a three mil, extends out over that, and that's all perfectly normal. So what we'll do next is we'll just tighten these guys up. Interesting uh, topic uh, while I'm doing these up is one of using Loctite. So it's a big question that always comes up in the forums to use Loctite, to not use Loctite. I personally don't use Loctite. I just, every once in a while, check the tightness of the bolts, and I, I don't have a problem with it personally. But that's not to say if you want the extra security to use Loctite, go ahead and use it. The important thing to remember is if you do use Loctite, use blue, not red. Because they, as they say, red's permanent. Use red, you're dead. So use the blue stuff. All right, so to finish off this section, all we're going to do is we're going to stick the PDB down. Then we're going to be putting the standoffs on. So pretty simple. Like I said, I'm going to be using the OSD PDB, not the standard one. But they're both pretty much simple, similar sort of things. They've both got an arrow on them that you want to make sure the arrow goes forward. And the arrow that goes forward is to the lower part of the split bottom plate. The thicker plate is, is the forward part here. The ones you can see, it's got little slits for the camera brackets in there. You just want to make sure that that's facing forward. Now to stick this, out, this down is pretty simple. All you got to do is get what's already supplied in the kit. You've got this double-sided tape which goes on there. Now I know it doesn't sound like much, but this is, this is good quality double-sided tape. And there's not that much stress on the PDB the way that you build it when you build it correctly. So this PDB is not going anywhere. It's not going to get ripped up so long as you build it correctly. Take off the one side, stick the backing down. And you got that double-sided tape there. So if we spin this around, we've got a little arrow here. And likewise, on this one, we've got a little arrow here. We just want to make sure that that is facing forward and just place it down and just press it into place. Finally, all we need to do is to add the standoffs. So these are these little uh, Jello rubber standoffs. Now, if you're getting the OSD PDB, what you'll find is it comes with standoffs of its own. The only difference is that they're going to be at about a millimeter longer and that's to allow clearance between the KISS flight controller or whatever flight controller you're using and the XT60 wire coming off the side of that because the base PDB actually has XT60 wires on both sides so you can use choose which side you want whereas the OSD PDB only allows one side and sometimes you can get sort of fouled on some of the like the KISS V2 and V1 connectors that come out of the bottom of the flight controller and the slightly longer uh, rubber standoffs will help alleviate that whether you want to use them or not it's totally up to you but the option is there so all we need to do is just screw these guys on and I just do them hand tight once again one hand on the testicle ow and so forth. Tighten those guys up and we're all done. Right, so next on the list is preparing the ESCs and the motors. But one thing I want to do is a little trick that I've worked out on the, the KISS 32 amps to make them a little bit durable. Now before I go any further, I just want to say that I don't know whether or not this is covered under uh, KISS or Flyduino's warranty, whether they recommend it or not. So what I like to do is you will see in here that we've got a whole heap of uh, caps on the top here. There's not much else. There's only caps and the FETs. I find the FETs themselves to be very durable, but a prop strike onto the side can actually knock a couple of the caps on that side or on that side. The ESC will still work, but what it does is it has less noise suppression, so you'll have more electronic noise going into the system. And over the times, the first couple of sets of KISS 32s that I've had, I've, I've actually knocked those off. So what I like to do is I like to get some five minute epoxy 
and place the five minute epoxy just over those caps to turn it into one solid mass. That makes them a lot stronger and it makes it almost impossible to knock them off during a prop strike. I do not believe that this is an approved method from Flyduino, so do it at your own risk, but I've never had a problem with it and since doing that I've never knocked off any caps off the ESCs. So first up what we're going to do is we're going to just rip off some strips of masking tape. You could use any kind of tape and all I'm going to do is I'm going to mask off everything on the top side of the ESC except for these caps. So that means any wayward uh, epoxy is not going to go in the wrong spot. What I'm going to use is just regular five minute epoxy you don't need anything special and all of course you'll just need some sort of bit of cardboard to mix it up on and something to stir it up on it's something like a toothpick something very fine because that way it's a good way to not only mix it but also apply it in in small amounts because you're not using very much but uh, don't have a toothpick handy here so one of these little coffee stirrers just cut into a bit of a, a fine point tip is is perfect in that sort of situation the important thing to remember with five minute epoxy is You've got five minutes to do this job and it's going off and it's going to get hard and cure after five minutes. So if you don't think you're going to get the job done in time, don't push things. So just remember that you're under a time limit here. Getting enough out, you don't need too much and then mix it up. So epoxy is a two part. You've got the resin and then you've got the hardener and it, becomes, it turns into an, an exothermic sort of chemical process where it starts getting hot as it cures. And you've got to ensure that you mix this up thoroughly, otherwise it won't go off. So all we're going to do now, a bit of this stuff and just dab it on like so and just sort of make sure to press it in so that it gets into all the little nooks and crannies and with how thick this epoxy is it's not going to run where you don't want it to run but on top of that you got things masked off so it's not going where it's not supposed to go. Now, like I said if things are taking a little bit longer than what you had planned it seems like it's starting to get a little bit hard just stop and mix up another batch. Okay so now that's all applied all we need to do is wait for this to cure so I wouldn't throw that away. Keep that when that's cured you'll know that that's cured really depends on the epoxy but probably be able to handle it within say about 20 minutes and be fully cured within an hour so let's put these off to one side wait for them to cure and we'll get straight back to it oh yeah so it's been about half an hour and the the epoxy now has cured you can tell it's a cured because testing on that it's not sticky or anything like that so cured enough for us to get on with it and we can rip off our masking tape and if we have a look on there we can see these ESCs here just these caps now that have all of the epoxy on them and nothing else is covered so that's the important thing that you want to ensure that you're not covering anything that you shouldn't be covering that's why I've put the masking tape on there so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to tin all of the pads that uh, we're going to use on this which is pretty much everything so the three motor wire pads the power pads the signal telemetry and signal ground wires are all going to get tinned I just like to use my little TS100 you should seriously consider looking at it 6s brings it up to 60 watts got oodles of power the good thing about this is you can carry it with you when you go uh, to various locations and then just use your your flying batteries to do on field work and because I travel so much this is the only soldering iron that I have with me and it's brilliant so for these terminals here I would probably put this at around about 350 degrees Celsius so me being super organized I don't have a little pad so I've just got a little napkin or whatever just put a little bit of water on there this is a good way of just cleaning the tip. The whole topic of soldering and good quality soldering always comes to mind whenever you see in the forums about good quality soldering and certified soldering and so forth. Soldering itself is not that hard to do. It comes down to three main things. It comes down to using the right, the correct tools. So good quality solder, a soldering iron that's powerful enough. Then you need to have good preparation and good technique. Get all those guys down pat and the soldering goes along pretty much without fail. And of course then you can sort of talk about is that the perfect solder and so forth. And to me it's, it's more down to the fact that is the soldering doing what it needs to do? As in soldering wires together and is it coming apart? If it's not coming apart, then obviously the soldering joint is good enough for the job that you're doing. Okay, so that's uh, all of the terminals tinned. The next what we want to do is we want to cut out the power wires and the signal wires for the ESCs. Uh, that's just a simple matter of just placing the ESC over the arm at the, the point in time you want to have it. So you want to have it so that it's not getting close to all of these top plates that are somewhere in the middle and then measuring out the length of wire that you want if you want to make them various different colors and so forth 
go ahead and do it. At the moment what I've got on hand is just black wire. So the power wires themselves you want to cut them at the, the correct length. We're just going to cut the ends off and tin them on both sides. The signal wire, these go from these middle signal pads in the middle here and they go across to the little signal pads over here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually cut them slightly longer so that once I put the power wires on there then I'm going to cut them to length afterwards. So if they look a little bit long when I cut them initially, that's not a problem. We're going to cut them to length afterwards. So let's go ahead and cut this to length. And then all we need to do is just cut enough of these to go the whole way around. And then, of course, we want to go in and get rid of the ends of them. It doesn't need to be very long. It can be quite short. And then, of course, we need to tin the ends. Whenever I'm tinning wire, I like to bring up the temperature all the way up to 400 degrees. It just makes the tinning process a little bit quicker. All right, so we've got all our wires cut to length, the power wires. So these are the 18 gauge power wires cut the length tinned on both sides and then we've got a whole heap of these 28 gauge wires which are cut slightly over length and tinned on one side so what we'll go ahead is go and just solder these guys on here this is actually the probably the, the longest part of the build if you're using like a kiss products because these guys don't come pre-tinned or anything like that so if you're using like a bl halley style esc this build would actually be really quick you've got the two pads on the outside which are the positive and negative and then you've got signal telemetry and then signal ground so that is the four escs all prepped Next, let's go ahead and solder them to the PDB. Since we're using KISS, the positive and negative are on the correct side with the FETs up. If you're using something like a BL Heli ESC, you probably will need to twist the wires, but just take into account your positives and negatives. It does make it a lot more complicated if you're using the same colored wire there. That's why normally I don't do that, but um, just keep an eye, an eye on your polarities and look at your schematics and your like your, all those all those sort of sheets that show you what terminal goes to where. Always double check that stuff, it's very important. Already tinned the PDB pads, so that's not a problem. And now we just need to go around and solder these guys on. So now we have all the power wires all soldered on in place and we just need to cut the signal and telemetry and signal ground wires to length. Now if you have a look on the, uh, the PDB here, we can see the middle wire is actually a little bit longer. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut each one of these wires to the correct length with the side cutters. And I wanted to do it like that because I wanted to get the length of these power wires to the correct length first, then cut them to the correct length so that you don't have excess signal wires sort of snaking around. So all we do is we just lay this down like so and just cut slightly past each one of the pads and then cut it to length. I mean, you could cut these the right length before you, you put them on, but this just makes it a little bit more likely to be the right length. All right, so that's all those guys cut the length. So what we want to do now is just um, strip a little bit of the wires. It doesn't need to be very long, just a small amount, and then tin them. Pairing these ESC wires is probably the most lengthy process of the whole build. Here's the wires cut off. Now we just need to tin each little wire. And now it's just a matter of soldering these wires down to the pads. This is where something like these little tweezers come in handy because it's quite tight in there. So you want to have like a nice small chisel tip soldering iron and these tweezers make life a lot easier, which I'll show you right about now. Now you can grab these guys, place it without getting your big buffy hands in, in the way. This would be a really frustrating thing to do if you had to use, if you just had your hands. So this is where like little things like these tweezers really do help out. That's those guys all done. And one thing I like to do nice and early is to put heat shrink over the ESCs. So I put the heat shrink over the ESCs to waterproof them and protect them and so forth. But there's been plenty of times there where I've done the whole thing and got to it and gone, oh crap, I haven't put the heat shrink over there. So do yourself a favor because I don't like doing things twice. So what we want to do before we go much further is to actually put a little bit of protective layer of foam underneath the ESCs on top of the arms. What I use is something that I've had for a little bit of a while is it's a sticky back thin rubber. It's only about a millimeter thick and I've just cut that to length. Whatever works for you, it doesn't really matter. The importance of putting this underneath there is that when the ESC gets a bit of a knock, 
rock, there's lots of electronics underneath there that you don't want to be getting knocked directly onto the carbon fiber because they could get knocked off their, the PCB and so forth. So this is just a little bit of protection for any sort of hits and so forth. Take the backing off, place it on the arm like so, and now when that ESC is sitting down, it's gonna sit on top of, of that strip of foam. And that is all four ESCs that are gonna be protected by this foam underneath the arms and so forth. So le next, Let's get the motors put on. I'm using the hype train motors, which use a 16 by 16. Of course, you, you've got the, the choice of 16 by 16 or 16 by 19 or 19 by 19. They all fit on these arms. It's not much of a problem. The big argument is, do I use four motor bolts or do I use two? Do I use steel? Do I use alloy? Once again, there is no such thing as the correct or incorrect answer to that. I personally use only two bolts per motor and when I have it, I use alloy. The reason why I do it is because I'm lazy. I did that right from the beginning because I just couldn't be bothered putting four in. It works just fine for me. Have I had times there where the motors have been sheared off the arms and the, the bolts have sheared? Yeah, they have, but the motor was so badly damaged that it was not recoverable anyway. So I've never really seen any use to go to more than two bolts per arm. Use what works for you. So if you want something that's going to live up to San Francisco earthquake, then use four steel bolts. Right, so that's the motor's all tightened up. And now what we want to do is we want to cut the motor wires to length and then trim them, tin them, same old, same old. So what I like to do with this is spreading them out so that they go to their respective pads and then cut them ever so slightly long. So I cut them a little bit past the pad to where the bat the fat is. A little bit of extra slack there. Yeah, it gives you a little bit of movement and a little bit of slack in case the ESC gets a hit by something. That's those guys cut to length. Now we just need to strip the ends. Just needs to be enough to be on the pad and no more. If you have it too long, you can actually run into problems where the wire fatigues at that point. Now we've just got to tin the wires, so we'll get, quickly go around and tin them. One thing I like to do in a situation like this is to bend these the ESCs out of the way, because if you've got the ESC down below it and you're tinning the wire, you might get some stray solar balls or something like that, or something drip onto the ESC. That's what always ends in a bad situation, so move the other electronics out of the way and you'll probably find that you'll have less problems in the long run. Once again, I like to bring the heat up to like 400 degrees, nice and hot when I'm tinning stuff. It tends to work a bit quicker and easier. So now we can bring these guys down and solder the motor wires to the motor pads on the ESCs. Once again, this is where the tweezers become really handy. Tweezers, tweezers like this are kind of like a tool that you don't need until you actually try it and you're like, wow, how did I live without these for so long? Now it's just a matter of sliding the heat shrink over, shrinking all the heat shrinks. So of course there's plenty of ways that you can do it. I find the best way for the heat gun, really handy tool to have. But hey, if you've only got a lighter or a gas stove or whatever, lighter works well. You just gotta be very careful that you don't overheat some other, some areas because it's the heat that comes out of a lighter is very concentrated. So that's all shrunk down now. So now what we need to do is to secure them down. And this is a technique that I've done that's exactly the same as the alien days. I haven't, I haven't changed it, it just works really well. And this is to use electrical tape wrapped around the ESC and the arm. One of the reasons why I've always done it this way, first of all, it's just something very, very simple. But second of all, it works quite well in an impact. So these ESCs are slightly wider than the arm. So if you have an impact where that ESC gets hit or a prop strike, there is enough movement with this electrical tape. Pull it nice and tight and just wrap it around about twice over the FETs. And there we have it. That is the ESCs and the motors all mounted onto the frame. Right, so next we're going to be mounting the camera onto the K brackets or the camera mounts, whatever you want to call them. And these K brackets go in like so into the frame here. These have got various orientations to go in. So if you get it the wrong way around, of course, it's not going to fit in there. So if we have a look, on here nice and closely. You've got the, this middle bit in here which the camera will turn around on and then you've got a, a, a locking mount bottom here and back here. So depending on which camera you use, for example, this Runcam Eagle 2 has the three bolt hole pattern in there and so you can use the middle middle bolt hole and then this bottom one to help tilt it and lock it into position. But you can the Runcam also comes with that optional back plate 
that you can use one of these uh, the back the back section there as well so you can choose whichever whichever way you want to go so pretty much any full-size camera will fit in here but since we're using the eagle 2 in this we're going to be using that middle section there and down there I'm gonna get one of these m2 bolts and we're gonna need four of them that goes through there put this onto the center thread put one on the lower part don't need to worry about tightening these guys up just leave them loose just tighten them up so that they're not going to fall out and once they're in we can tighten them into place and next we want to get the camera bracket on the other side like so and once again keep them nice and loose either side and then these guys will just slot in like so later on but we'll put this off to one side and put that in when we've got the rest of the quad all ready to go for final assembly so that's the camera mount all done and dusted okay top plate next so what we're going to be doing is just getting the top plate ready and attaching the vtx and antenna to the top plate so that's all ready to go we've got laid out what we need here we'll need the top plate we need the uh, the battery foam your vtx antenna uh, antenna tubes we'll also need uh, the little antenna mounts as, as well which we've got right there um, need a couple of small zip ties, some small heat shrink, and some foam tape. First off, let's mount the foam battery pad. These usually come with the offcuts in the middle of the foam still inside, which you need to get rid of. Get rid of the backing of the foam to expose the sticky back. And the top plate right down the back, it all lines up. It's pretty obvious where it's got to go. So then what we want to do is we want to spin it around upside down, and now we're going to mount our VTX and antenna. Got the Tramp VTX. What I'm going to do is remove the little SMA nut and washer don't need to use that we're going to mount our Spironet antenna on there what I like to do first is to get some heat shrink to put over the SMA connector because this SMA connector is going to be touching the top plate and because this is carbon and because carbon can conduct, conduct electricity you need to be careful that you're not grounding something so the, the SMA connector is actually a, a grid, the ground part of the antenna. So it's just, it's good practice to make sure that this is insulated if you are touching the, uh, the carbon directly with your antenna, which this would be if the heat shrink wasn't on there. So slip a little bit of heat shrink over the spironet, tighten this up. This is very incorrect of me, but all I've got here is pliers. And so that's all I'm going to use. It's important with these SMA connectors to actually ensure that they're done up tightly. If it's only done up like hand tight, it can loosen itself off. So I want to make sure that this is done. Like you're not trying to rip everything apart, but it needs to be done reasonably tight. So there's no way that that's ever going to come undone again. So now that's tight, you don't have to worry about that. Heat shrink goes back over the top of all of that. And then we use our trusty heat gun. And now we're not going to have any grounding issues with our antenna. So now we need to look at mounting the uh, VTX setup on there. I'm going to be mounting the VTX with double sided foam tape. It really depends on how thick the, uh, the foam tape is. But with something like this, this is only like a millimeter thick. I'm probably going to use about three or four layers of this to, uh, to stick it down. So I'll just cut this to size stick down a couple of layers and if you're ever sticking down double-sided tape like this and it comes off after a while have a look at cleaning the surface you might find that there's like a bit of oil or something on there and you're not getting as clean of an adhesion as what you possibly could so if the surfaces are nice and clean and you're using a decent quality double-sided foam tape it shouldn't really come off okay so now we've got a decent amount of double-sided tape mounted on the VTX like that so that's going to give it some shock absorption for when you have uh, nasty hits and so forth which will help to stop you breaking things in a really bad accident and where we're going to mount this is we're going to mount it facing that way and you can see right about here that's where the hole is for the central front standoff and the vtx is going to mount just behind that so we've got enough room so that uh, when we have the the connectors connected at the front here here and here that they'll still clear the the standoff and that's that's all we need to worry about but if we have a look further back we can see that the pigtail for the the tramp is too long for this situation but that's fine because what I like to do in this situation is curl this around like so and then we have a basically a circle in there and the circle is there to take up the slack but is also um, a way of making sure that things aren't taut and it's a, like almost like a strain relief it's a section where this can move around and it's not going to directly affect the antenna or the UFL connector on there so let's get stuck into mounting the VTX first pull the backing tape off that and if we put this down once again we're going to be putting this so that it's 
just behind that hole for the central standoff, press it into place. And now we're going to be mounting the spire in it, or whatever antenna it is that you're using, further back with good old zip ties. Once again, this is the same method that I used for a very long time uh, on my Alien builds. This is just a bit of a refined top plate. It works really well and really hasn't failed me. So all you need to do is get zip tie going through this section here, and we're going to put the zip tie around where was the threaded section just in here. Then we grab our second one and it goes just behind there through this section back here. And we basically have an, one zip tie here, one zip tie there. All I do now is I just ensure that these things are done up nice and tight with my pliers. And this is another good point when it comes to zip ties. When you get zip ties, get good quality ones. Don't get the cheap 30 cent ones because they're not well rated for UV. They break down the UV and they also snap really easily. So you don't need to use these massive wide diameter uh, zip ties when you're using good quality ones. These are, I don't know how expensive, zip ties aren't awfully expensive, but good quality ones from an automotive supply store will last you for ages and you won't need to go overboard with them. Cut the tails off and there we have the fully mounted VTX system. So if we go around the right way around, we can tilt the antenna up like so. And in a crash, this is going to be pushed forward or out of the way. And one of the reasons why I've mounted the foam tape so thick is the back strap will go around here over the SMA. And that doesn't matter if it goes around there because that's hard mounted. And it doesn't matter if it's if it gets squashed by the battery. But the front strap actually goes in between the top plate and the VTX. You can see there that it doesn't squash the VTX or the pigtail so that in a crash situation where things are getting knocked around, it's not affecting any of that and it's still free to flow. And that's the important thing that no pressure is put on any of that pigtail. Otherwise you will start getting broken uh, UFL connectors and so forth. Next step, antennas. So these are the specifically designed antenna mounts which were designed to alleviate the need for zip ties and heat shrink and so forth. Uh, they're really simple to use and um, they've got a left and a right. That's about the only thing you've really got to remember about these two. If you get them the wrong way around it just means that the antennas face forwards rather than backwards. So what you're going to need is the antenna mounts themselves, the antenna tubes, and the m3 by 16 button head bolts i'll start off with these antennas i mean you can have them any length you want but uh, for what i use i find that the, the standard length is too long i don't really have a set length all i tend to do is let's go about uh, two thirds of the way down and cut that off keep it real simple done cut commit what else i like to do is to heat up the ends with a hot air gun and then squish it down with some pliers so that's what closes off the end so the antenna can't go out the back. So now we've got these two antenna mounts here. We've got, we've got two holes that go through them. The one that's going vertically through there is for the bolt and the one that goes off to one side to 45 degrees off to, to one side is for the antenna. Now these, these actually work uh, kind of interesting because you slot the antenna in there and by themselves these will actually spin in and out and you can adjust the length very easily but as soon as I put the bolt in there because the way that it's been designed it's a friction fit so if I screw this in now this is not going anywhere so it's it's locked into place so it's designed that once you've got the bolt through there it's locked into place and you can't pull it out so so the way that we install these guys is to just put these antennas through like so and ju I just have them sticking out the end just a little bit and we get our top plate and then we get the whole sort of uh, middle from the back and just put our two M3 by 6 16 bolts through there and you will need your two millimeter driver and all you do is you just thread that in a little bit and then you can see when it's sitting at home and all finished it sits like that and that antenna is not going anywhere it's nice and snugly home there and this antenna position um, I put here after a lot of trialing I find this is the best antenna position at least for the 2.4 systems to give the best range and the best receiving ability all round of this quad. Next we've got the PDB. As I said earlier on, I'm using the OSD PDB, but what I'll do is I'll do a quick little how-to on to wire up the basic PDB if that's the way that you want it to go. It's very, very quick and simple. There's not really much difference to it, but we'll go over this just for the sake of helping you guys out that are using this instead of the full PDB. The basic PDB of course comes with the XT60 and you've got battery pads on both the left 
and right. It doesn't really matter, you can mount it either side, it would really depend on the flight controller that you're using uh, or the side that you, you wish to go from, so I'll let you choose which way you want to go. And you also get these little connecting harnesses as well, and there's two of them that, that come in the packet. So you've got two here, so you've got one with plugs on either side and one with plugs and just wires on the on on the other side so the one with just a plug on one side this is for say if you were using a beta flight board or a race flight board where you can just plug this into the connection at the front here like so and then you've got all your wires and the wiring diagram which you can get off the impulse rc website to connect to the different motor wires and power wires and so forth and that still allows you to disconnect your flight controller if you want to work on it replace it or whatever it gives you an easy way of it of disconnecting it now, since we're going to be using the KISS fly controller, we're going to be using this one right here, which once again just plugs into there. And then we've got these two wires here which simply plug into the KISS fly controller, and that gives you a really easy and seamless way of connecting it up with a lot less hassle and a lot less wires to worry about connecting. The only other thing that you would need to worry about that, apart from things like your, your ESC wires, which we've already done on the other one, is to connect up, since we're using a tramp, we're going to be using that we're going to be connecting up our power wire for our tramp and if you got went into your tramp uh, box you'll see a little connector like so and so that is goes into the tramp that end goes into the the camera end and this is your power so of course the tramp will take up to 6s and all we're going to do is just uh, solder directly to the pdb so what we're going to do is since we don't need this little jsd connector cut that guy off and then just get the ends ready and we're just going to prepare the wires and the PDB. So all we need to worry about is tinning those wires there and then we would tin that guy and then we've got a positive and negative on there and that's about as much as you need to do for the basic PDB so if we put this over the top like so and we pretend like all these power, the, the power wires and the signal wires for the ESCs are all done this is ready to go that's as much as preparation as is required for this so you've got the power wire for the for the tramp and that goes into the tramp end and this goes into the camera end but let's get stuck into the full osd pdb on and how we're going to wire that guy up once again you'll get two of these wires this one is the kiss one same as before the only difference between this and the basic osd one is the white wires you'll see so there's some extra wires there for all the extra functions that you're getting off the osd pdb but apart from that they do the same thing so we're just going to be plugging this into the back and these wires here just save so much time when it comes to preparing all this sort of stuff the, all this extra stuff that you no longer need to solder on just makes life so much more simple so we'll start off with the xt60 here so we've got the two pads on the side here uh, positive and negative and they're all marked out on there so the first thing i like to do is to actually get this and just basically flush the the ends of of these because these are come pre-tinned but you really don't know what solder is on there and it might be lead free solder i don't know i just never trust these things that have been pre-tinned so i just like to um, ensure that they give them a good flush and they've got the same type of solder on them we want to solder it so that it goes slightly forward on the arms here you'll see that the xt60 wire is actually staggered it's staggered for a reason so that it can actually be uh, slightly forward uh, so if you see that it's staggered it's done it I actually done that for a reason it's, it's it's supposed to be like that no mistakes were made so that's all soldered in place and next you want to have a like a small uh, zip ties I use the same zip ties as I use on the top plate and you'll see on either side of the of the top plate here you'll see these little uh, these little slits in the, the top of the, the split bottom plate here and here and therefore strain relief for the XT60 so they're on both sides so that you can use them for whichever side that you decide to mount it because because we're using this PDB and we're on that side, all I do is slide that through, tighten it up, side cutters to cut it off. And now we have some strain relief here. So if you eject the battery and you've got an XT60 which doesn't want to unplug readily in a crash situation, you're not going to be straining at the, uh, the power pads or anything like that on the PDB and wrecking it because you've got all the strain relief going through that zip tie. Right, so let's get the camera all connected up to the PDB. Since I'm using a Runcam Eagle 2, there's two wires here, so the first wire here, and these two wires will come in your, your Eagle kit. One has got power, ground, and video, 
and the other one is ground and camera control. So because this PDB, you can change the settings within the, the, the PDB OSD, we're going to be connecting up camera control through there as well. We've got two connectors on the back there. It's pretty easy and they're self-explanatory. They, they can only go in one, one way, so it's not a problem. But what we want to do is we want to get these two guys and we don't need the connectors on the other end, so we're just going to cut them off. So first of all, let's just measure out a bit of a distance approximately long enough that we need we can do what we need to do and cut them and then as usual prepare the ends of the wires we've got those guys tinned the only finicky part is we've got one ground pad but we've got two ground wires so what i like to do is to get these two guys together in my hand like so and this first pad is our ground pad let's order that and so next is the red wire which is the five volt for the camera and then the next one is the camera control or the blue wire done and lastly is your video signal and done and that's your wires all connected up for your camera so next is to wire up the wires going to the vtx this is pretty simple if you go into your uh, tramp box you'll find one of these connectors with just some bare end wires and exactly what we need to use the only thing we don't need is the orange wire which is the the camera five volt wire because we're getting um giving power to the camera via the pdb we no longer need that that orange wire so it is a simple matter of cutting that off. There's one less wire we need to worry about. You don't have to cut it off, but I don't like stray wires. And the rest of these guys will go into soldering onto the PDB. So before we do that, it's very important that we need to select what voltage you want to run the output of the OSD PDB to power your VTX. So of course you've got some VTXs out there which are five volt, but there's some VTXs out there which will take uh, LiPo power, but they don't go quite down to five volts. So for example, I'm pretty sure the Tramp's minimum voltage is six volts. So if you ran this off five volts, then it wouldn't run. But if you ran, um, say, the Unify race, which is five volt of this PDB, then if you ran that on, on the, the 7.5 volt section, then you'd overpower it and you'd probably fry it. So on here, there's a little, uh, a little uh, tab on here where you can short it and you can select which one you want, either you want 5 volt or 7.5 volts. Since we're running the Tramp, which runs full uh, power and runs either 6 volts or higher, we're going to want the 7.5 volts. So if we look down here, this is something I've already done earlier on. Here there's actually three pads and I've actually bridged the, the left two pads, the middle pad and the left pad, right there. So now that's selected, so that's going to run on 7.5 volts and will easily power the Tramp. Next up we need to connect all of these wires here and once again I don't trust the type of solder that is on these wires so let's go ahead and just flush these guys with some clean solder probably going over here overkill but I do like to do that it makes me a bit more sure of things and then we can start soldering it if we go from if we go from the top first of all we start with our ground wire and then we go our power wire so this is will be the 7 7.5 volt wire and the next one down is the audio wire. And the reason why we put the audio wire in, because of course the PDB has also got a microphone on the front there. And then the last one down the bottom here is your video wire. And then lastly, the white wire goes over to UART1, which is right here. And that's our telemetry wire. So that's your tramp telemetry, or it'd be, say, your smart audio if you were using a Unify, and that allows you to change the channels within the um, the OSD, if that's the way you wish. Uh, what I will be doing at a later stage is I'll be adding the TNR NFC little uh, antenna on the side of this because I personally prefer to use like the wand and the, the NFC system to that. Um, but this allows you to use both systems. So we'll install that a little bit later on. But that is essentially it for the PDB. And now that means that everything is connected and it's all ready to rock so let's get on to the flight control so because we're using the pdb there's very little soldering on the flight controller all you need to worry about is soldering the receiver to the flight controller and that's only three or four wires depending on how you're going to put it together so all we need to worry about is we've got these three pads here they've got holes through them you've got uart1 which is your signal wire for your receiver then you've got your five volt and then you've got your ground and if you're going to be using telemetry, which I'm going to be using, you've got your telemetry wire, which is that little pad, the bigger pad of the two pads further inland. That's the only pads you're going to be doing. So first up, let's get stuck into 
tinning those pads and preparing them. And all those guys have got through holes if you wanted to use them. I'm not going to bother. I just go directly on the pad. It's easy enough for me. So if you had another receiver, then you'd, you'd need to prepare these wires. But this is uh, one of my trusty X4Rs. So I'm just going to solder up all the, the wires that I need. So first up, we're going to go with signal wire, which is on top. And then your red power wire and your black ground. And then lastly, blue in this case for this one is telemetry. That is all of the soldering that's required on the flight controller, so all sorted. So what I, I, what I like to do is to just feed that underneath like so, and then we can go and get the frame, bring these wires around here. Now the important thing that you need to remember about plugging in these wires coming from the PDB is that both of these connectors are the same connectors so that you can get them mixed up. Uh, there's three connectors on the side of the KISS. We're only going to be using the bottom two. But it's very important to note that if you swap them around and get them the wrong way around, you can blow up your flight controller. So it's imperative that you get it the right way around. It's pretty easy to remember. The black goes in the back like so, and the white goes in the front. This is why they're two different colors, so it's very hard to get them mixed up. Just make sure that they're seated nicely. But like I said, make sure you get them the right way around because if you get them the wrong way around, you let the smoke out and then everyone ends up being angry. So all I'm going to do here, and this can get a little bit fiddly, just route the wires so that they go around cleanly, something like that. And just double check that it all sits nicely. Now that that's sitting on there nicely, if you go over to your hardware kit, you will find four of these nylon M3 nuts and they can go on top. Now I personally never bother to tighten these with a wrench or anything like that. Finger tight for me is not a problem. They're only on nylon anyway, so you, you don't want to over tighten them. But if they're reasonably tight via your fingers, they're not going to be going anywhere. And that's the flight controller installed. So all we need to do now is to worry about uh, putting the, uh, the receiver in. Receiver is really simple. Just a matter of getting some double sided foam tape and cut to approximate size. I'm getting really good at guesstimating these sizes these days. I've done so many of them. Put it on the bottom of the receiver, get the backing off, and then all we do is we just place the receiver in the back of the quad like so. And you just got to be careful that you're giving enough clearance for the standoffs when we put them on later on. Okay, so now we're on to the final part of the assembly. This is just getting everything together. One thing you'll notice in the kit is that you'll have two of the 24.5 millimeter standoffs spare that's because if you don't want to use these antenna mounts for example maybe you're using crossfire or something else or you've got your own antenna mounting system you can basically get rid of that and then put these in place of this in the short standoff so you've got a bit of a choice but because i'm going with these these antenna mounts we're not going to be needing these last two because so they can go off to one side and we're going to be mounting all the standoffs on the bottom of the frame first so we're going to be getting the front here which is this section here all the wires and we're going to be getting our three 30 millimeter standoffs and mounting those guys and we're going to be mounting them with the three millimeter by six millimeter button head screws if you are using the alloy pack then they will be cap head screws just for a bit of extra strength uh, stop them from pulling through but in the steel pack you don't need to worry about that they're perfectly fine the one thing that is worth mentioning is that if you are using the alloy pack which i normally do use this middle standoff you do need to use the steel bolts rather than alloy bolts and that's how the alloy alloy pack is uh, set out because if you use an alloy bolt in the middle there's a possibility to shear it off in a really big hit so you need to use the steel bolt there instead there's your three standoffs at the front three 30 millimeter standoffs once again doesn't need to be uber tight just hand tight for the moment once we get it all together we're going to cinch everything up now we go down to the back here and at the very back, we're going to be using the 24.5. I love it. 24, but it's not 24. It's not 25. It's 24.5. These go down the very back. And then middle back, these short little suckers there. What is it? 14.5? That's right. Not 14, not 15. They're 14.5. And those really short ones are going to mount up against the antenna mounts. So that's those guys all sorted. So let's just cinch these guys up a little bit just to make sure they're not going anywhere. And that's the bottom half of the frame all sorted. So now we can grab the camera mount which is right here. And first off let's get into plugging up these cameras. So once again it's impossible to plug these guys incorrectly. There's two plugs in there. One's a three wire plug and one is a two wire plug. 
plug dev up. All you got to do is put the camera brackets in the little respective slots. Especially when new, it should be a nice solid mount. So there's no free play in it. And then we can get our NFC tag. Where I like to mount this is on the side here like so. It's nice and protected right there, but it's also a great place where if you're using the wand, you can get that in uh, and it doesn't take up excess space. So the wire itself actually goes through like so. Let me just grab this with the tweezers. One, and this is just stuck on with double-sided foam tape. And in your tramp box, you'll actually get a nice little bit of foam tape that comes with the kit so that you can easily mount this in place. And that's just by chance happens to be the perfect height between the top and bottom plates. It works really well. We pull that tight, that fits in there nice and perfect. That's the NFC tag all done. And if we spin this around, now we want to connect up the VTX tramp to the two wires here. And that's just simply two wires you want to connect up. Once again, you can't get them the wrong way around. Two different size plugs, and they just plug in like so. And they're in like Flynn. Last thing we want to do is just feed these antennas through the holes. The only thing that you do need to watch out when you're closing this up is this center standoff. If you're not careful, you can actually pinch these, some of these wires when you're pushing this down. So it's just important to make sure that the wires are all nice and free of that central standoff before you push it down and commit and then all we need to do is just push that down onto the camera mount like so and everything is in place and then what i like to do is start off with these guys here continue screwing that down until it goes into the standoff so these are these uh, antenna mounts are reinforced nylon so they're a glass fiber reinforced nylon so they're quite strong i wouldn't be too worried about possibly squashing them and they thread into the, al the alloy standoff below it. So wouldn't have to worry about de-threading it. That said, you don't need to go down until you've got like about two tons worth of force on it. It just needs to be appropriately tight. Then we're going to use some more of these guys. This is the M3 by six millimeter. Once again, down the back here. We, I always use the button head bolts on the top because I don't like having cap head bolts because they stick out a fair bit and if you sort of crash upside down they, the, the cap head bolts have a tendency to pierce batteries and so forth so we always use the button heads on the top and now all we need to worry about is installing the, uh, the GoPro mount. The GoPro mount uses slightly longer bolts which are supplied in the kit so the one down the back uses a M3 by 10 millimeter cap head bolt at the back and at the front we have M3 by 8 millimeter button head uh, bolts at the front. The other things that are very important to include in this is one of these cone washers for the back and we've got these M3 uh, stainless steel flat washers for the front. The reason why we use them is it actually spreads uh, spreads the load of the bolt pushing down on the 3D printed part because without that in a really bad crash what might happen is you might pull through the 3D print and, and the thing just rips off. But if you put these on, I've not had one uh, pull out of me ever since. We'll get our M3 by 8 millimeter button heads, put the washer over it and just push it through on the front. Get our second one and push that through. And then our M3 by 10 cap head. What I like to do is put the cone washer in place down the back there and then feed this through. And then you've got all three of those guys sitting nicely. And now you just need to put that on place like so. Start off with the front ones. And this, so this is a 3D printed part. You don't need to go uber tight, but where it starts squashing the uh, plastic down is, is enough for me. It turns into a bit of a friction fit and that, it's not going anywhere after that. And it's just a matter of doing the rear one. The rear one goes through the back of the GoPro. It's one of the reasons why you've got a round hole in the back. And then tighten that down. And the last thing we need to do is add the battery strap. We have a battery strap that goes around the back over the SMA connector and then we have one in front of the, the middle rear standoffs but then in between the top plate and the SMA pigtail that way that is protecting all of the VTX. Now if we just do a little bit of a test fit because people have so many different ways to actually that they they route their battery wires as well so it really depends on how long your battery wires are and a lot of these different companies have them different lengths but these particular batteries that I use are some of these Dynergy graphene batteries which have been working well for me. I have the, uh, the battery lead go on the opposite side and then it goes over the top like that and then plugs in like so. That makes sure that it's tight 
and it's not flopping around anywhere and not getting into any of the uh, electronics or, or any of the propellers and, and causing issues. We've got everything together so there's only one better way to test this out than to plug this in and do the whole smoke test. So I'm confident, if you're confident, let's plug this sucker in and see if things actually work. I think that's a positive. No smokes come out. All right, so now we've got the quad all built. Let's go through a quick rundown of setting up the flight controller and setting up the ESCs and the OSD so that you've got everything updated and everything's ready to go. What we need to start off with is to get the correct firmware. So we've got to have an internet connection, jump on the internet and go to KISS Racing and you would go into the download section, go into the, there's the GUI down there and if you press that, it bring, brings you across to this one here. And of course, if you're gonna be using a Mac, you'll be downloading that one. If you're gonna be using a Windows, you'll be downloading that one. Whichever way you wanna go, download it. Mine's already downloaded, so I'm just gonna open up the program. And of course, here we have the, the KISS uh, program. So it's just a simple matter of micro USB, plug it into the KISS flight controller. You don't need to worry about pairing the flight controller. And connect. First thing it's going to do is it's going to want you to activate it so this is why you need an internet connection uh, because it'll check the serial number and make sure that it's an authentic flight controller and so forth so all you need to do is just press ac activate now and then you are all sorted. First thing that I would be doing is going to FC Flasher and this is where you're going to update your firmware. So once again, you need to have an, a, an internet connection because you're going to get the firmware directly through the uh, user interface. And uh, you, can, you can do manually if you want, but it's much easier if you select it going through the internet. So select remote firmware, and we're using a KISS FC V2 F7, and then you've got all your different versions there. So um, the RC, the 1.3 RC34C is the latest one. I always, the, the public beaters, I always just use the latest one. I do a lot of testing of the ones before they go public. If they go public, then there's generally not a problem with them. I wouldn't be scared to use the latest and greatest one. Download firmware, see how good the internet is. It's good. The internet sucks in Australia. That, that's about 45 seconds to a minute to do that kind of thing. So that all comes down there, and it's just a matter of pressing flash firmware, and you'll see the progress bar down the bottom. Wait for it to go through it, and all successful. Recycles the power, and now that's all sorted. Next thing you want to do is update your ESC firmware. Very simple as well. Just select, select ESC flasher. And for this, you will need to power up your uh, quad because you need to get your ESCs powered. And so then you just go, I know what I'm doing. And what I find sometimes, I don't know why this is the case, but when I go into the ESC flasher and power it up, for some reason it doesn't actually show all the information. So all I do is I go out of it and then back in again, press that and now you come into the screen. So once again, you're selecting remote firmware from the internet, and so you can select your different types of ESC. So we're using a KISS32 ESC, and the firmware is gonna be the latest 120X download firmware. Once it's all downloaded, we've got our power in, flash, and the ESCs talk to you, so fancy things. And if we have a look on the ESCs, you'll see that all four of these ESCs are flashing quickly and the status light of the flight controller is flashing quickly as well. So that's saying that everything is flashing normally. If anything was, any one of those ESCs or anything was flashing slowly, it was that's a sign telling you that there's a problem with it and you need to try and flash it again. Now, if you have a problem with something flashing part way through uh, this kind of situation, you can, what they call bricking the ESC, the bricking the ESC, you can't actually brick it. And actually, let's try this out. Let's do a little bit of a, a test. So we disconnect it. Let's just say that, oh no, we had a bit of a problem there. What could possibly happen here is that the next time you go and flash it, the ESCs are not actually, they're not reading anything and, the, and nothing seems to be working. And I've had some people that say, I can't flash my ESCs. So here's the workaround for that. So all you need to do is plug it in and connect, go into ESC flasher. I know what I'm doing. Select KISS32, select the, the download the, the firmware that you want, download the firmware, and then all you need to do is press flash firmware, wait one second, and then power the ESCs. And that puts it into bootloader mode and forces it to actually start download, uh, start the, the flashing process again. So we go press flash firmware, plug in, and now they're flashing again. So if you ever have a problem where you have a problem while it's 
flashing the ESCs, something happens and for whatever reason now they won't work, they won't light up, they won't flash. That's the way that you force them into reflashing some new firmware on there. So now we just have to wait a little while. It takes about a minute or so for it to flash on the ESCs. I'm just gonna sit here for a while. How's your day been? Yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah, it's a long day, but you can't, I mean, look, they all say that, that, yeah, but you did like slap him in the face. Yeah, I, I, but I don't care what time it was. If you want to have a Coke, go and have a Coke. But if you're going to call him a futuristic asshole, things are going to happen. I've told you that before. Don't look at me like that. Okay, so once you get to 100%, uh, she'll make a bit of a noise, and then you'll all need all you'll need to do is disconnect your USB and then disconnect the power. You got to recycle it for safety reasons. Then plug it back in, connect, go back into this, uh, and the last thing you really need to do configure for the ESCs is the direction of the ESCs. Uh, for the motors that, you, that you're driving. So each motor is different. They're not all the same the way that they're wired up. But I know from experience that the hype train motors wired this way. It is ESC2 and ESC4. Press sit, save. And now I've reversed motors 2 and 4. So now it's just a matter of setting up the flight controller. Disconnect the power. Recycle the USB because when we have power connected there are certain uh, important features of the flight controller which are disabled for safety reasons so that it won't accidentally start up on you or anything like that but if we go through and reconnect now we've got the, the power disconnected lipo disconnected what you can do down here is you can back up and restore old files and so forth I've already backed up some files which I know work quite well and this is a good starting point for your quad if you were to build it the same way as this now I can't guarantee that it's going to fly great but this is a, a setup that works uh, for me and it's a good starting point so you can start with this and then fiddle it to tailor it to suit your needs and tailor it to how your quad flies in particular and open that up and then press save and these are some of my my current uh, settings on this quad so you got min throttle at 1070 max throttle 2000 min command at 1000 uh, i don't use idle up i just use well what people call air mode kiss doesn't have air mode but i just arm it the normal way don't see any difference and perfectly happy with that d shot 2400 selected i have arm on aux one and i also have buzzer on aux two set uh, and what i mean by buzzer is with d shot you can set it so that the motors make a beeping noise uh, so you don't actually have to have to have a beeper on there. So I personally don't run a beeper. Uh, I find that the noise made by the motors is loud enough. If I need to make a louder noise, all I do is I just arm the quad for half a second. The LPF I set to high. Of course, Quad X, FR Sky, S Bus, because of course I'm running a Tyrannus. And failsafe is set to zero. So that just means how long the quad is going to go to level mode and have idle, uh, the throttle set to, to idle. So I don't want any of that um, after it gets into a failsafe. I want the motors to turn off and I want it to fall out of the sky. Uh, we've got my PIDs and my rates there. There's not really much I can talk about there except to, for you to see the numbers and you can compare it to how you guys have it. And if we go across to advanced, uh, set point weight is at 65. I have the adaptive filter. Uh, turned on and I have a little bit of uh, dead band receiver dead band and really not too much more to talk about there of course I've got loop time set to one kilohertz there's no point in having uh, the loop time set any higher particularly on KISS uh, when you go higher than one kilohertz you don't actually get the adaptive filtering working that automatically turns off because even in an F7 it doesn't have the processing power to do the adaptive filtering the way that KISS does it on anything higher than one kilohertz and there's no point one kilohertz works perfectly fine. So data uh, output, nothing really more to, to, uh, to look at here. This would be just a good point to, just to make sure that your receiver is all receiving once you've got your receiver bound to your transmitter. Nothing special in rates, TPA that's how I have this. I have a, a custom TPA set uh, out in that. That seems to work quite well for me. And that's pretty much it. That's all some of the secret sauce. People ask for the numbers and all that stuff for my PIDs and that's all of those. It's nothing special. Works quite well for me and hopefully it'll work well for you. It, at the very least, it's a good starting point and, and a base setup that you can go from there. So the next is to set up the 
OSD PDB, so we'll get stuck into that next. The only particular you'll need about this is you'll need a Windows machine, so at this present point in time, the, uh, the, the Reverb OSD only works on Windows, where Kiss and all this stuff works on Windows and Mac. I've just downloaded uh, Windows via Boot Camp. If you're a Windows guy, you'll be happy. To get the actual program, it's just a matter of going to the Impulse RC website and it'll be up there. Don't know exactly where it is at the moment because this is all pre-production stuff, but when it is actually up and running, it'll be the, on impulserc.com, available for you to download. Once you've downloaded it and installed it, simple matter of opening up the screen and it is also, it's automatic update on many things. So first of all, no drivers required for this program. Uh, when the, the GUI itself needs an update, it'll tell you. In this case, it does need an update. So we're gonna tell it yes, let the GUI update. So that's all sorted now. Now it's just a matter of plugging the micro USB into the OSD USB port. Make sure it's the, the, the OSD, not the, the KISSFLY controller. And with this, you will need to connect power to get it to communicate. So make sure your props are off. And in it goes. And of course, once again, automatically, if new firmware is available, it will tell you. So yes, we want to update the firmware and automatically it just updates the device. And that is all fully updated. Now I'm not gonna go through all the settings that I have on the OSD myself. Uh, I'll just go through the basic ones. So I just have the power output and the, the channel on the left hand side. I have the, the amp drawer in the middle and then I have milliamp hours and voltage on the right hand side. I keep it really simple. I don't need a lot of information. And I also have my Tyrannus set up through telemetry. So I get all of these audio warnings. So I get both, I get both on the screen and I get uh, the, the audio warnings through the Tyrannus as well. So it's pretty hard to, to miss anything in that regard. The rest of the settings really are not much of a muchness, but that's the OSD all set up, nice and simple. All we need to do now is just put props on and take it out for a fly. Okay guys, we are finally done. The props are on, everything's built and everything's updated. I really hope you guys got something out of that. We're a little bit entertained, maybe got a bit educated. For those of you who are building a first quad, maybe building along this video, if this helped you, then that makes me really happy. So I do these kinds of videos to help people out there get through those binds because I always know your first, build, your first build is always the hardest one. So if that's helped you, it's made me happy. See you guys on the next one. Thanks guys. You're sitting there editing away, but you're gonna get your revenge because you're gonna find the most dopey looking video segment of me and you're gonna use that as the intro. Energy!